भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वेलकम टू टुडे रीडिंग फ्रॉम ब्रिलियंट एस द सन रीटेलिंग ऑफ श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो फाइव द यूनिवर्सल ऑर्डर विल बी बिगिनिंग चैप्टर टेन टुडे किंग राहुगना चेस्टाइज भरत मुखम कलोति करोति वाचाल बंगुम लंघय थे कि यदि श्री गुरु नेताण परमानंद माधव श्री चैतन्य ईश्वर हरि ओम तत्सत वर्ष वन प्यूगल्स एंड ट्रम्पेट्स ब्लेड आउट मेक वे मेक वे हिस्स रॉयल हाइनस किंग राहुगना रूलर ऑफ सिंधु एंड सॉवीर अप्रोचेस Merchants hurriedly guided their mules to the side of the road. Brahmins scurried out of the way. Guards carrying large sticks pushed stragglers to one side. Behind them was a bugler, a trumpeter, and a regally dressed courtier announcing the king's presence. Behind them, Rahugana rode in a palanquin draped in silks, which was carried by four stout men. Their faces covered in sweat. Behind the procession were more armed guards. Rahugana. Leaned forward and called to the courtier, "The king, the river, Ikshumati is near here. We will stop by its banks. I need to relieve myself. We will not tarry long. Otherwise, we will not arrive at Kapila Ashram before nightfall." The four carriers were each given a clay pot of water as they waited for King Rahugana. When he again sat on his palanquin, they prepared to lift him. One of them suddenly clutched his chest, collapsed to his knees, and fell flat on his face. The king's courtier ran up and turned him over. My lord, he is dead. This is most inconvenient. Complained Rahugana. He directed the guards to find someone to replace him and ordered the other palanquin carriers to cremate the dead man. Be quick! I don't want to be sitting here all day. The guards pushed through the crowds, looking for someone suitable. In their haste, they grabbed any mail they could lay their hands on. Come on, you! They said to a large-bellied merchant, "Do you want to kill me too?" Moaned the merchant, "I am unfit for such hard labor." Another guard grabbed a tall, skinny youth. "You will do." A blind Brahmin held on to the youth. "He is my grandson, only a boy. Without him, who will guide me?" Then one guard spotted a large, muscular man. "Hey, you! What's your name?" The man seemed not to hear, and kept walking. Ignore me, will you? Shouted the guard, raising his stick to hit the man. Someone in the crowd shouted out, "That's Jada Bharat. He is deaf and dumb." The guard lowered his stick and grabbed Bharat by the arm. "Dumb hug. That's fine. You have firm limbs. Oxen and asses are dumb too, but they can carry heavy loads. You are just what we need. Come along." He dragged the unresisting Bharat to the palanquin and motioned him to grab the handle. The courtier then called out, "On the count of three, lift the palanquin. One, two, three." A guard poked Bharat and motioned for him to lift. "Come on, pick it up." Verse two. As the procession moved off, Bharat kept his eyes fixed on the ground and scurried here and there. and bharat kept stepping around them because of his erratic pace the palanquin lurched from side to side king rahugna leaned out and barked why are you men carrying the palanquin unevenly you better shape up or else verse 3 the three seasoned palanquin carriers looked fearfully at each other one said to the others he will surely have a severely beaten if this continues another said one of us has to speak up and tell him what's going on go on then said the third you tell him verse 4 your majesty said the second palanquin carrier please be merciful we are not at all negligent in discharging our duties we have faithfully carried your palanquin for a long time just as you desire this new man however is not walking at a steady pace we cannot do our service properly with him verse 5 rahugna glared at bharat so this is all your fault is it one guard nudged the other he is in for it now the king will kill him the other guard whispered i'm sure he will give him a chance the king is adept at politics let's see how he deals with this crazy fellow 
I don't, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes, whispered the first guard under his breath. Kings are dangerous like serpents. Anger is their second nature. They both glanced sympathetically at the unfortunate Bharat who seemed oblivious to the problem he faced. Barsik Sarugna's mouth twisted into a tight smile and he called out, How troublesome this must be for you, my dear brother. You look so tired because you have been carrying this palanquin alone for a long time and for a long distance. The guards and courtiers, realizing the king was humiliating Bharat, laughed loudly. Rahugna leaned out of the palanquin. and poked Bharat in the chest, arms and legs with the end of his sheathed sword. Besides this, I can see you are old and not very strong or stout. Passers by stopped to see what was going on. They pointed at Bharat and joined in the laughter. Rahugna's tone was sarcastic. Are your fellow carriers are not cooperating with you? Bharat said nothing. Why should he be disturbed? The king was merely insulting the body. He, the soul within, was neither fat, lean, strong, nor weak. He had nothing to do with the material body. Body's combination of the five gross and three supple elements. The courtier informed Rahugana that Bharat was dumb and King shouted, carry on, do it properly this time or you will be sorry. Bharat bent over and lifted the palanquin along with the other carriers. As before, he kept his gaze focused on the ground before him and carefully avoided stepping on any ants. The palanquin, verse 7, the palanquin wobbled precariously. Rahugana's crown slipped over his face and he exploded with rage you fool what are you doing have you no sense are you dead although appearing alive he leaned over the side of the palanquin and glared at Bharat do you not know that I am your master how dare you disregard my order for this disobedience I shall punish you just as Yamraj the lord of death punishes the sinful I shall have you beaten to within an inch of your life. Verse 8, he shoved Bharat away from the palanquin and continued to rail incoherently. Bharat stumbled backwards, remembering the fate of the decoits who had tried to kill him. He prayed to Krishna to forgive the king. Influenced by passive passion and ignorance, the deluded fellow thought himself a monarch. Although he considered himself learned, he could not recognize Krishna's devotees. Bharat looked at the red-faced king. He felt compassion and wanted to uplift him. It was the duty of the Lord's devotees to show kindness to all living beings. Verse 9, he smiled and said, My dear king, noble hero, all you have sarcastically said is correct. There is no reason for me to be tired, nor have I carried the palanquin a long way. Your reprimand is the truth, for it is only my body. which carries the palanquin, not me. I have nothing to do with the body. You say I'm neither stout nor strong. Only a person who does not know the distinction between the body and soul would speak in this way. The body may be fat or thin, but no learned man would say such things about the spirit soul, the actual person. The soul is neither very stout, is neither fat nor skinny. Your statement that I am not very stout is therefore correct. And since only my body is carrying this palanquin, there is no trouble for me, the soul. Rahugna scowled, you dare answer me back. Do you lack the sense to fear me, your king? Verse 10, Bharat told the king's gaze, held the king's gaze with no sign of fear, stoutness, leanness, physical and mental distress, fear, dissension and material desire. Old age, sleep, material attachment, Anger, lamentation, illusion and false ego are all external to the soul. They affect one in material consciousness, but they do not exist for me. I am therefore none of the things you mentioned. Verse 11, everyone present glanced anxiously at Rahugana. Bharat alone remained peaceful. He said, my dear king, you accuse me of being dead, although breathing. 
This is mistaken unless you think we are the bodies we inhabit, in which case everyone, including including you, are dead, although breathing or intrinsic, intrinsic to the material bodies is a beginning and an end death. You are also correct in thinking you are the king, my master, and thus entitled to order me. All such designations are ephemeral. Today you are a king and I am a servant. But tomorrow our positions may change. I the master and you the servant. These designations are not who we really are, but temporary circumstances created by our past karma. Rahuguna grasped, as long as I'm king, I'm your master. Verse 12, Bharat said, this is just temporary differentiation between us. Arising from social convention, who is truly a master and who a servant? The real master is material nature, which obliges us to accept different roles. If you think you are the master and I am your servant, please order me. What can I do for you? Rahugna stared at Bharat with his mouth agape. Who was this? This man, he looked at like a mad vagabond, but... He spoke like a philosopher. In low voice, he said, Who are you? They called you Jadabharat, but you do not seem dumb to me. To be very dumb to me. Verse 13, Bharat said, Really, do you not remember calling me a rascal, a dull, crazy fellow? How, just a moment ago, you threatened to beat me? Bharat smiled at the bemused monarch. I am a self-realized soul, my dear king. Rahugna's handsome features registered disbelief, self-realized soul. You look like a madman. If I am insane, what will you gain by beating me? It would be like beating a dead horse. There will be no effect. Punishment is not the cure for madness. Verse 14. People in the crowd criticized the king and praised Bharat. One said, why is the king so harshly chastising this innocent person? Another said, this man Bharat must be a great yogi, see how peaceful and tolerant he is. Yet another man said, yes, and he speaks wisely. Others in the crowd whispered to each other, he seems to be completely free from the bodily concept of life. True, said his friend, he has the natural humility, humility of Krishna's saint. As this spoke, Bharat bent over and picked up the palanquin by his handle as before. There was no point becoming angry with Rahukna, he was bewildered by false ego and simply an instrument of Bharat's past misdeeds. By carrying the king, he was destroying those sinful reactions. Verse 15, Rahugna sank back in his seat, unsure what to make of Bharat. He was travelling to Kapila Ashram. Hoping to hear sages discuss Kapila's philosophy of the absolute truth, such discussion had the power to destroy all suffering. Remarkably, this man's word echoed Kapila's teachings. Thinking himself the king, he had offended him. How foolish Rahugna alighted from his palanquin and prostrated himself before Bharat kindly, excuse me for insulting you. Rising to his feet, verse 16, he dusted himself down and said, It seems you are a Brahmin, for you wear a sacred thread. Yet you move among us, acting as if mad. Tell me truthfully, who are you? Bharat looked down and said nothing. He had said enough to protect the king from committing a grave offence, but he had no desire to speak any further with a materialistic person. Rahugna examined him carefully. Are you a highly renowned saint, possibly the Tatreya? Who taught you this knowledge you display? Whose disciple are you? Pray tell me where you live. Why have you come to this place? Are you on a mission to do us good? Please let me know who you are. My dear king, why so many questions? Verse 17, let me tell you, good sir, even if King Indra hurled his thunderbolt at me or Lord Shiva his trident, I would not be afraid. 
I do not even fear Yamraj's staff nor Kuvera's weapons. I am fearless in the face of the elements like fire, sun, scorching sun, moon or wind, but I am terrified of offending a Brahmin. Therefore, please tell me who you are. I am simply your palanquin carrier. Verse 18, despite himself, despite himself, Raghuna became impatient. Enough with trying to fool me. I know you must be a great yogi. Who else could have spoken such profound philosophy so difficult to comprehend? Raghuna took a deep breath. Why was he always so short-tempered? He spoke more gently, my dear sir. Please do not continue hiding your great spiritual knowledge. I see you do not associate with anyone. Is that you want to stay fully absorbed in meditation of the Supreme Lord? If so, you are surely advanced in spiritual knowledge. Please tell me why you wander around as if dull-witted. Bharat remained silent. Verse 19, Raghuna looked down at him from the palanquin. Maybe he needed to be more conciliatory in his tone. He said, O oh, saintly person, your words are quite in accord with Kapil Dev's teachings on yoga. However, I am dull and not able to understand everything properly. Kindly remove my doubts. You appear to be a sage who has perfectly understood the yoga science. Surely you are here to give spiritual instruction. I accept you as a spiritual master. What is the best refuge in this world? Still Bharat said nothing. You are not Kapila Dev's representative. He slapped his forehead again. Why did he find it so hard to speak gently? He was simply alienating this saint. He calmed himself and said, I think you are acting deaf and dumb so that you can assess who is actually a human being, one interested in spiritual advancement. I suppose you do not want to waste your time speaking to materialists like me who being attached to family and worldly enjoyment cannot understand spiritual truths. Somehow or other we have met and I'm asking you to enlighten me. Please tell me how can I make spiritual advancement? Verse 21. Still Bharat said nothing. Rahugna let out a long breath. Maybe if he challenged his earlier statements, he could goad him to speak. Of course, it is possible. You know nothing. After all, you said some things I could not accept. He looked for Bharat's reaction, but there was none. Rahugana continued. You said that you are the soul different from the body and therefore not fatigued by body's labor, bodily labor. I do not agree with that. In my experience, when the body feels tired, I, the soul, also feel tired. I disagree with you on another point as well. You said our relationship as master and servant is an illusion because it's temporary. Again, I cannot agree. This world and our relationship in it may be temporary, but they are still real. The king spotted a clay water pot lying discarded by the side of the street. He pointed to it and said, just like this clay pot, this clay pot, ultimately it is nothing but earth. But while it is a pot, we accept it as such in the same way. All the temporary designations like master and servant are not eternal. They are real for the time being. Verse 22, Rahugana stared pensively at the discarded clay pot. As he did so, he remembered an argument he had heard from his court Brahmins. He said, I can prove that contrary to your statements, the condition of the gross body affects not just the mind but the soul as well. Rahugana tapped the pot with his foot. If I put milk and rice in this pot and place it above fire, then all the rice and milk are not in direct contact with the fire, they will also get hot. Similarly, although the mind and soul are not in direct contact, contact with the external world because they are in the physical body when the body feels pleasure or pain they feel they too feel it this is my dear sir the proof that the body's physical condition affects the soul rahugana studied bharats who continued to hold the palanquin and stared impassively at the ground the king would surely have more to say verse 23 rahugana went on 
you said other things I felt very, were strong. You dismissed the relationship between the king and his subjects as inconsequential because it is temporary. But that does not mean it is unimportant. The king is duty bound to rule the citizens and punish those who disobey the laws. You said it is useless to punish a deaf and dumb person. I disagree. When the king forcefully obliges any of his citizens to do their work, he frees them from their past sinful reactions and benefits them. Bharat remained silent, showing no sign of agitation or pride. Raghuna realized he could not trick him into speaking. He stared at him curiously. Surely this enigmatic man was a genuine saint. Anxiety seized the king's press. He had completely mishandled the situation and was simply compounding his original offense. Verse 24, he spoke again in conciliatory tones. What you said confused me, but I am sure you are a self-realized soul. Advanced transcendentalists are compassionate to those in distress and they desire everyone's good with no external consideration. Although I know you are beyond duality and unaffected by the either praise or blame, I have committed a grave offense toward you. Bharat continued silence under the king and he dropped to his knees with folded palms. My dear Lord, I beg you to show me compassion. I have insulted you. This will surely ruin me. Offending Krishna's devotee will destroy even Lord Shiva. Therefore, even though you are undisturbed by my offense, please show me mercy. So, this brings us to the end of chapter 10. King Rahugana chastises Bharat. Thank you for joining. Hariyam Tatsat Hare Krishna. We will begin with chapter 11. Bharat instructs Rahugana next time.